chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. <coughs> this is what it says. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the richness or the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That is, the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of his will, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Amen. Like what, how does it go? I know, I don't know. No, not what the future, future holds. <coughs> but I know who holds the future. It's a secret known only to him. God knows, God knows everything. We serve a living God, don't we, church? Yes. We serve a God that is alive, who does know the future, and I'm just so grateful that um, that song could be shared. Wasn't it a beautiful song? Yes. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful song. So thank you very much for sharing with, that with us today. I think you're aware that I don't usually tell children's stories. Children's stories are not my forte, so I will be asking some of you when I preach here again to please do the children's story for me. Now some of you are looking away as though I'm not talking to you. Yes, I'm talking to you. So please, 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 if I come and when I come here again, I'll ask you to do the children's story. God does know the future. But in the present, sometimes we go through pain and heartache and things that are difficult. Sometimes things are painful. We don't always have a good week, but we have a God who can con console us. We have a God that can comfort us, and we have people here that, that we can rely on to support us. And I'm just very grateful for that. Before we start, can we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, you are the, you are the God of everything, and into your hands we want to leave everything. Let the Holy Spirit be here today, let it work through me, and let not I be seen, but you be seen. Let it be the Holy Spirit's words that are spoken. Allow me to be your vessel. Amen. Amen. To start, let me ask you a question. How many of us like music? Does anybody here like music? Who likes to sing? I see there are hands that are down that I know like to sing, but that's okay. I know that this church likes, likes music and this church likes to sing. I was here for the opening and dedication of this church and we had lots of musical items. We had choirs, we had soloists, it was a beautiful time. And even though sometimes we may not sing to our full potential and capacity, I know that this church likes music. The German theologian Martin Luther said, next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. And I'm sure that there are some who agree with this. There are some passages in the Bible that were perhaps originally set to music. The most notable biblical text 
originally set to music is the Psalms, or sections of the Psalms. But did you know that some individuals claim that other sections of the Bible may have been set to music? Let me say this, it's some individuals claim this. Some people say that part of the book of Ephesians was set to music, or at least it was set upon some musical structure that was available at the time. As such, I believe that this musical church may be interested in a potentially musical portion of scripture. Would I be right? Yes. Would I be right? Yes. Okay, I'm glad to hear that because this is the sermon that God has given me today. So today we are going to be looking at the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. Many of us know that the New Testament was originally written in Greek. It is said that Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, is one sentence in Greek. Look in your Bibles at Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. How long is it? Is it a short passage? It's not a short passage, it's a long passage. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 is one sentence, and it's almost, well, in, in my Bible, it's almost half a page. It's almost half a page. One sentence, half a page. I very recently completed my master's program in theology. I had to write a dissertation of 20,000 words. Some of you may think that's a walk in the park, and to you, I say, that is wonderful, but it was a difficult thing for me to do. It took me months to complete. When I first began to write, I wrote in long sentences. I then sent my first draft to my supervisor for comments upon, upon what I had written. When my supervisor saw my work, he said these words to me. You need to write in shorter sentences. Short sentences help the understanding process. I thought, short sentences? I can't write in short sentences, I've got too much to say. <coughs> However, after some discussion, which involved primarily me listening to what my supervisor had to say, I decided to shorten my sentences. In the end, my supervisor won, and I could see the benefit of writing short sentences. However, there were some occasions when I became enthusiastic and excited, and I would write the occasional long sentence. Have you been, ever been so excited about something that you talk and talk and talk and talk and um, you don't seem to finish a sentence? Has anyone ever experienced that? I've experienced that. Or have you ever had an idea that you just have to write down and punctuation is not important? It seems as though stopping would be a distraction. Perhaps, just perhaps, this is some of the thought behind Paul's long sentence. Paul's long sentence, that's Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, does, however, tell us a lot about Paul's thoughts regarding God, Jesus, and the Spirit. Today, I primarily want to focus on Paul's, Paul's thoughts with respect to God, taken from Ephesians chapter 1. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. We'll read verse 3. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Who was the first person that Paul speaks about in this particular sentence? Blessed be God. God is the first person that, that Paul speaks about. He says about God, blessed be God, or blessed be God. The Greek word for blessed simply means praise. So praise God is how he begins, or God is worthy of praise is how he begins. And then he continues, why is God worthy to be praised? The second half of the verse says this, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. We praise God, or God is worthy to be praised, because he has blessed us. We serve God and we praise God because He has blessed us. God has done many positive things for us. What God, 
Let me ask you a question. What good things has God done for you this week? Would someone like to shout something out? What has God done for you this week? How has he blessed you? Sunshine. The small things that sometimes we take for granted, God blesses us with. He blesses us with health and strength. He blesses us with many, many different things. But Paul is not praising God or saying God is worthy of praise for the temporal things, for the, the practical things, what I'd say. He says, I want to praise God because he has shown us spiritual blessing. <clears throat> that is not to minimize what he is, he is doing in our lives today. But Paul has got a different focus. So what are these spiritual blessings? Let's continue. Let's continue. Let's read verses 4 through to 6. So at least 1, 4 to, through to 6. So we can find out what these spiritual blessings are. It says, Just as he chose us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. Accepted in the Beloved. Verse 4, it tells us that we are chosen. Verse 5 tells us that we are predestined as sons. And verse 6 tells us that we praise him because of grace. That we praise him because of grace. Before I came up, I was asked, what is the title of your sermon? I hesitated and didn't tell the person who asked the question what the title of my sermon was, or at least the title of this section of my sermon. The reason is, I don't like to give it out, because it's easy for people to jump to conclusions and not let me explain what I mean. <coughs> Does anyone ever jump to conclusions with you? Do people think, well, this is what you mean when you say this, but you mean something totally different? We all, at times, jump to conclusions. There was a lady that lived in a tropical country. She had a dog and a small baby. The baby, the dog loved the baby and would protect it all the time. So she felt comfortable when she went out that the dog would protect the baby. And day after day, week after week, month after month, this did happen. She was a very happy lady. One day, she came home and saw a scene of devastation. She saw the dog. It came towards her. It had blood on its mouth. And she thought the worst. She killed the dog because she thought the dog had killed her own baby. But as she went into the room, where her baby was sleeping, she found the baby there, alive. But there was blood all over, all over. Where did this blood come from? She noticed that there was a snake on the floor. The snake was now dead. The dog loved this baby so much that it was prepared to battle the snake in order to save the baby. But the lady had jumped to a conclusion. She thought that this dog had killed her baby, but that was not the case. All too often we jump to conclusions without seeking, without searching for the reality of the situation. We ought not to jump to conclusions. We ought not to jump to conclusions. But let's go back to the biblical text. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, it says that we are chosen. Ephesians 1 chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 tells us that we are predestined. And verse 6 tells us that we have God's grace. So God gives us grace in order that we are chosen. In order to say that we are predestined. We are predestined. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 5 that we are predestined. And because of this, I believe in predestination. I believe in predestination. Perhaps that makes you feel uncomfortable. And if so, I'm glad, because it should make you feel uncomfortable. Many of you may not want to scream and shout and tell me to come down, but let us not jump to conclusions. 
listen to what I have to say, and maybe, just maybe, you may believe in predestination too. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines predestination as the doctrine that God has ordained all that will happen, especially with regards to salvation of some and not others. Now, dictionaries are useful. Do we agree with that? Dictionaries are or can be useful? They can be. But did you know that the meaning of a word can change over time? Let me, tell, let, me, let me take the word, awful. If someone says the word awful to you, what image comes to mind? How would you define it? How would somebody define awful? Wonderful, amazing. Is that how we would define it? So how would we define it? Horrible, Horrible terrible, <coughs> horrendous. That is what awful means today. You think of something bad when that word comes into your mind. However, awful is made up of two words, or, which is to hold something or someone in high regard, and full, meaning complete. So you completely hold somebody in the highest regard. Originally, awful had the meaning of being awe-inspiring as well as worthy of, of or commanding profound respect or reverential fear. So in its original sense, an awful individual was regarded as a person in the most positive sense. The current dictionary definition of awful is directly opposite to the original <coughs> definition. It is opposite. So what about the dictionary definition of predestination? Do I believe that this definition is the right one? Or should I say, do I believe that the definition that we have in the dictionary, which is the doctrine that God has ordained all that will happen, especially with regard to salvation, do I believe that is true? Do I believe it's biblical? No. I do not believe that that is a biblical definition of predestination. Because the verses in Ephesians chapter 1 define the biblical definition for us. And it's defined in a different way. And it is defined in the light of trust and defined in the light of choice. But that still leaves us with a question. How do we actually define predestination? There was a man. His name was Edward. He was born in June, June, 1894. The oldest son in his family. He was born into a rich family. He was born into a very rich family. I'm sure his mother, Mary, and his father, George, were very proud of him the day that he was born. In 1910, Edward became Prince of Wales. This Edward was a member of the British royal family. In time, Edward's father, George, died, and Edward became the King of England. 362 days later, that is less than one year later, due to his relationship with a woman called Mrs. Simpson, he abdicated his role as the King of England. Now, my point is not really to look at why he abdicated his throne. All I want to do is highlight two things. Before his birth, from the time that his mother knew that he was pregnant, both his mother and his father had an expectation. This expectation was that this child was to be the future monarch of England. This child was predestined to that role. The child had done nothing to deserve it. The only thing that it had to do with, that it had to do, was to be born in order to be royalty. And born he was. At, at 16 he was given the title of the Prince of Wales and at 41 years old became king. But he had done nothing to deserve this predestined role. But he had had, but he had this role anyway. However, less than a year later, even though he was predestined to be king, he chose to reject this predestined role. It was his decision. He was predestined to be king, yet he refused. I believe in predestination, but predestination not in the way that we see it defined in the dictionary. I believe in the biblical definition. These verses, what these verses are saying, that God has chosen or is calling all people to him. Before our birth, we are all predestined to adoption in Jesus. We are all royalty. 
This is what God wants for us all. Everyone in this room, everyone in Bilston, everyone in Wolverhampton, everyone in England, all the world, this is what God wants. He wants us to be adopted. We are predestined to be adopted and to be his children, and therefore have the inheritance that he's laid out for us. Do we understand this concept? Yes. However, we can choose to say no and prevent God's intention from occurring. <coughs> when, a child, when a child is adopted into a family, they have all the rights and privileges of all of the other children. This means that they are entitled to any inheritance available. Any inheritance existing is in part belongs to this child. When we agree to the adoption into God's family, we are given this inheritance. Ephesians 1.14 speaks of this inheritance as our redemption, eternal life with a loving God, through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. It is God's pleasure to adopt us and give us an inheritance. The inheritance is eternal life with him in his coming kingdom. But we can choose not to accept it. God is saying to you, I want you to be my child and have all of the benefits that I have. I want you to have an inheritance. Will you accept it? The thing is, we can reject this adoption. We can say no. We can live our lives the way that we want to live, outside of your adoption, which means outside of your inheritance. God will respect that, but he will still call you. He says, I have predestined you to be with me, but will you come? God wants us all to come back to him. He wants us to, want to come into his presence. He wants us to sign the adoption papers. He wants us to be adopted and give us the inheritance he has planned for us. But he leaves it as our choice. Not everyone will be saved. But everyone is given the call or the opportunity to be saved. It is up to the individual whether or not they choose to be adopted into the family of God. I believe in predestination. This predestination is a call. The outcome of predestination is a choice. It is your choice. Predestination is God's will for us to be saved, but he leaves the final choice with us. How many of us want to respond to God and say, yes, I am glad that you have chosen me, and I will choose, I choose to be saved by you. How many of us does that apply to? Who wants to be saved by God? Because I know that I do. Now I hope you believe in predestination too. God's call to us, as I do. But, there is a question. And it's a question that at times we just do not ask. God has chosen us. God has predestined us. God has saved us. But the question is, how does this affect our lives in, the, in our everyday goings on? How does it affect me in a personal way? What is the practical message for my life? God has done something and is doing something amazing for us. God has saved us if, if we choose to accept this. He has saved our lives. So if somebody saves your life, how should you respond, is my question. Could I suggest we respond with gratitude? Would that be reasonable? If someone has saved you, you respond with gratitude. Is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. I believe that it's reasonable. reasonable. How does a grateful person respond to a kind act that has been done to them? You know, there are many ideas surrounding this, and. I have just, I'm just going to highlight a couple. On one list I read, if you're grateful for something or someone, one thing that you can do is share a specific example of something that the person has done for you and how it made a difference in your life. That was number one. And number two, it's give them the gift of time. Nothing says I appreciate what you have done more than an investment of your time. Actions speak louder than words, and doing something will show you're grateful more than just saying it. In short, a grateful person is a sharing person. This means a grateful Christian is a sharing Christian. 
Now it has been said we should preach the gospel and where necessary use, use words. And I don't quite agree with this. I do believe that we should preach the gospel in our actions. And as such, Christians should be the most loving people in the world. Is that right? I believe it's right. But I also believe that we will be given an opportunity to share while we are grateful to God in words as well. That is not to throw things down people's throat, but God will open up opportunities for us and we can share. We build relationships and we share with people because it's the most natural thing to do because we are grateful for what God has done for us. This, I was going to tell you about something that I read this morning, but if you want to know about that, please see me later. The second thing that we can do is we share our time, our love, and our words with people. Because a grateful Christian is a sharing Christian, and a grateful person gives time to the one that they are showing gratitude towards. If we are grateful, we will spend time with the one that we are grateful to. Christians, as the most grateful people in the world, because our lives have been saved, should spend time with the one we are grateful to. And who is that? Who is that? And who is that? It is Jesus. It is God. We ought to share what God has done for us with others in our action and our words and spend time with Him. This is how it makes a practical influence in our lives. Friends, please don't forget that God wants to save you. He wants, you, he wants to adopt you. He wants to call you His child. This is a reason to be grateful. In conclusion, let me just tell you a story. There was a woman in a restaurant with her young son. And they were eating. The woman took up a piece of toast and took a bite out of it. But the toast went to the back of her throat and she couldn't breathe. She started to panic, she started to wave her hands around and um, no one was doing anything. Then her young son noticed that, oh, mom's not breathing. Mom is choking. And he said it out loud, my mother is choking. There were some people at the table next to them, and one person said to the other, that lady is choking, and she needs some help. And they did nothing about it. All of a sudden, someone came up behind her and took her and started giving her the Heimlich maneuver. She just melted into these arms. Once he gave her the Heimlich maneuver, the bread was still there. Twice he gave her the Heimlich maneuver. The bread was still there. Three times and the bread came out and she took a deep breath and began to cough. Someone put a chair down beside her and she sat down. But the person who gave her the maneuver then wanted to go away. But she just held his arm. She did not want to let go of this person because of what he had done for her. This lady then goes on to write in an article in a newspaper how can I say thank you or show gratitude to the man who saved my life? She continued, it's completely and utterly obvious that thanking someone for saving my life is impossible. All thank yous come up short. So instead, she said, in order to show my gratitude for my life being saved, let me tell you my story. The story of an evening when that could have so innocently, innocently been my last breath. And then, let me tell you my hero's story. The woman's life was saved and she was incredibly grateful. Out of this gratitude, she wanted to tell others about her hero. Friends, we have been saved too. We ought to tell others the story about our hero, because we are grateful for what he has done for us. But what is the subject of our hero's story? That he has predestined us to adoption. That means he wants us to be with he wants us to be with him in his kingdom. But we can choose not to be. God wants to save people. He wants them to be adopted into his family as his sons and daughters, and to claim the inheritance of eternal life with him. He has predestined you to be with him, but the final decision is yours. My appeal today is short. And it is simple. How many of us choose to be adopted into God's family today? Amen. Who will choose him? I believe in predestination. Do you? Amen.
Amen.